All right, welcome to the Lower Shore Land Trust a video on best management practices on agricultural lands. Um, we're going to be talking about reforestation, re wetland restoration, and how these tools are used to achieve better water quality in our local waterways and to provide habitat for wildlife species. This video provides an overview of two different properties and how they're managed to achieve best practices. The video serves as a training guide for Lower Shore Land Trust staff and volunteers to better understand opportunities for conservation beyond a conservation easement. Lower Shore Land Trust is dedicated to preserving rural lands, promoting vibrant towns, and building a healthier and more connected Eastern Shore. We assist landowners and local communities in Somerset, Wicomico, and Worcester counties who wish to achieve conservation goals for habitat necessary to sustain a diverse and healthy wildlife population, natural buffers that maintain water quality, and preserve scenic vistas and landscapes surrounding sites of historical and cultural importance. It's always a privilege for land trust staff to get out on preserved lands. The Harvey property is truly a special piece of land located in the Coastal Bay's rural legacy area in Worcester County on Johnson Bay. This is a crucial ecological zone of preserved forests, farms, wetlands, and wildlife habitat. The Harveys have owned their property for 25 years, land that was previously managed under the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. This is an alfalfa right now. This yeah. stretch, this and this were in an alfalfa. Uh, that's just winter wheat. That uh, area there behind the Clumps House is, uh, was CREP, it still is CREP. And then beyond that, where that tree line is, that was another area where we had the forest mulcher come in. I had um, targeted that as an area for quail habitat. Uh, and that got replanted. And you can see there below the tree line, you can see the, the tall grasses and stuff that have come up um, as a result of the planting just this, this spring. Uh, but that's winter wheat, that area there, that CREP that the winter wheat is on now, uh, that was, well, the CREP was 20-something years old. And once again, it was supposed to be kept open field meadow type of look, but the volunteer maples, gums, all the stuff that you don't want to have to dominate your meadow, uh, we're getting to the point where I had to kind of start all over. So I replanted there and just just to kind of, all right, let's get a baseline here. I'll get some winter wheat. I'll let it go, I'll let it mature in the spring and, and summer. It'll drop its seed and then I can go on top of that and continue to develop that area. But the time being, it's... it's Pirate's Wharf is a property of over 340 acres owned by Wacomico County and purchased with funds from Maryland's program Open Space. The vision for the park has evolved over time once completed, the park will serve the community with walking trails, a boat and kayak launch, and interpretation of the area's rich natural and human heritage. Now in the implementation phase, the county has spent the last year reforesting areas which were once farmed. In a few years, the effort will result in a diverse forest area that will provide water quality benefits along the Wicomico River, as well as many benefits to wildlife, including birds and pollinators. This park is really interesting because we have the, uh, the riparian area here right up against the shoreline, uh, the first 100 feet of the critical area, really uh, critical habitat. Then we've got some early successional habitat where we've just planted. Um, and there's new trees that are going to take a few years to come up. And right across the street, um, it's still the same property. Uh, we have mature pine forest. And then in the rear, we have some really nice oaks and a wetland area. So it's a really exciting habitat. And um, without walking very far through this park, you can see uh, various different types of uh, habitats and, and different species. We tube the highest priority species, uh, about 800 oaks, uh, to prevent deer browse um, to ensure their survivability. Uh, and the tree tubes also help the trees grow faster, um, in including a, a number of those are, are popping out of the top just after one growing season, which is pretty exciting. We asked Land Programs Manager Jared Parks what other practices he keeps in mind when selecting a property to protect. 
Well, when I first get going, I, I, I try to find the right overall protection mechanism for the entirety of the property if I can, but then I look further down into it to see, first of all, if the landowner doesn't really want to do a full easement to protect the property, they, they have a lot of different options open to them for other things that they can do to enhance their property, to make it potentially more valuable for, for different things, whether it's ag or forestry, uh, to reduce their impact on water quality, um, or, or just to bring more habitat in, if they, especially if they're a hunting property or something like that, they might want to enhance the areas around that are natural so that they get more deer or turkey or quail or something like that. And we can help them find the right programs to establish those on their property with less cost to themselves uh, and, and some really good professional consulting to know what's best and where to put it. It must be hard sometimes to look at a property and know that a landowner may want to do something specifically for turkey, but you know that you could really um, um, point them to programs that might benefit bird habitat and you know get some mutual benefits. So tell me a little bit about projects that you've done um, that you think you, that you can really direct landowners to something like that. Well, it, you know, I always listen to what the landowner wants first. I mean, that's who we're working for and that's who we want to please. Um, but they don't always know that if you do things for habitat for ducks, for instance, that you're also going to be having a whole lot of other benefits for a whole suite of different things that use the same habitat. And so if you kind of tweak things a little bit here and there, not only will you have a haven for ducks potentially, but also a whole bunch of different birds, butterflies, pollinators, and things like that, that you can just commingle the benefits of different um, or of one program to get different outcomes from the same from the same work um, and then within that what we try to do is expand existing areas of habitat if there's a forest that has a break in it see if we can get it filled in so you have more of a contiguous forest area or if it's a forest that might connect to a riparian area where it will allow species of, of plants and animals and stuff to move throughout the um, green infrastructure, as they call it, up and down and, and into new different areas where they might otherwise be isolated if you didn't connect them to something else. All right, so um, when, you, when you have an easement or just a, a, a plan that you're looking after, um, you'd want to look at the plan first and identify what the purposes within the plan are. Um, you could have a forest plan that is just strictly for timber management and, and what you're looking for is just a working forest and you want the best, most healthy, highest board feet producing working forest you can get. Other forest plans are adapted more towards wildlife or water quality and therefore you would manage those in a different way. And so what we try to do is get the landowners connected with the right forester, the right forest consultant to realize what their goals for the property within that forest. So if you go into a property as a land steward and you're looking at a forest that is for water quality or habitat, um, you're going to be looking for things that maybe have a little less uh, harvesting overall, um, a little more diversity of the tree species. Um, and if you find areas that maybe are a little deficient in some of those ways that you can work with the landowner or talk with the landowner about other management techniques for that area of the property to make it um, sort of more connected with everything else so you don't have a, an unusable spot that's just not a high quality woods um, for forestry or for wildlife. And so uh, you can identify those by sort of looking at the areas of the property and seeing what's different uh, um, and what you're not seeing as much in. When we're walking these properties, we're hearing birds all the time and seeing critters and bugs and whatever. And if you pay attention to those things, oftentimes you'll see there's a whole bunch of stuff over here and there's nothing over here. How do we maybe even it out or make this one, this section a little bit more productive in, in keeping with the other section of the farm? Some of the goals for forest management include uh, timber management, uh, managing the forest for water quality benefits, managing it for upland game habitat or natural resources uh, or wildlife. Um, and each, each management goal would mean that you'd manage that forest slightly differently, whether you might limit a harvest in certain areas or harvest more in other areas to open the forest up um, to actually um, end up reaching the goals of the, that management plan over time. One of the things that uh, is probably the most uh, 
difficult to manage part of an easement stewardship wise is our required buffers and we have required buffers along all perennial blue line streams meaning those streams are full of water all year they're they're moving water the whole time so they're taking a nutrient and sediment load somewhere else um, all of our easements require a 100 foot buffer on those perennial streams, but there's also other areas of the farm that feed into the, to that area that may not be a required buffer. So when you're walking around on properties, if you notice some erosion in a ditch or along a road, an access road, or even around the buildings um, because there's insufficient guttering or something like that on the building, you can put that in your report and we can take that back to the landowner and say, hey, did you know that you have an, an erosion problem over here you might want to talk to somebody at the Farm Services Agency or NRCS and see if there's some help uh, for somebody to des design something for you to alleviate those problems so you don't have as much nutrient or sediment runoff from those areas. Um, and you can also look when we, on our <laughs> required buffers, you also want to make sure that they're, they're the sufficient width as required by the easement um, and to make sure that there's no other problems that are going on in that buffer like for, for instance you could have uh, an invasive species um, infestation in it that is, is uh, in, impairing the buffer's ability to provide the right habitat or potentially even be uh, an erosion problem in and of itself um, and so we can look for a lot of those e uh, issues, note them, and then go back to the landowner later and have conversations with them about things that they might be able to do to uh, enhance their property for these uh, concerns. All right, my name is Mary Ann Pettis, and I have been working for the Land Trust almost four years now. I am the stewardship monitor uh, coordinator. So I'm the stewardship coordinator, and uh, my job is to go out or make sh or, or go with volunteers or have volunteers go out on all our 130 properties to basically monitor compliance. Um, but we um, enjoy going out. We get to go out and see these beautiful properties. I also really enjoy talking to the landowners, getting to know them, getting to know the things that they want. Maybe the, and then I can bring information back to the office and Jared or Suzanne can then contact them with some more uh, information about the MPs they want to implement on their properties as well. So for our volunteer uh, training workshop, we like to cover safety, we like to cover um, what kind of information they need to take with them, the camera, what kind of photos we need from the um, landscape when they go out on the properties, and what to do with the information they get so that when they see something that maybe piques their interest or concerns them, they know not to talk about it on the property. That's something that you bring back into house and we as trained staff then go through and look at the reports, look at the easement itself to see what's required on the easement. So when we do our trainings, we emphasize that we want our volunteers to go out to look at the property, use their eyes, take documenting photos from strategic points to see what's on the property. But they're not really there to enforce anything. They're to come back to the office and bring um, anything that concern them to our attention. And so far it's worked really well. Our volunteers come from all different kinds of backgrounds and when we do these trainings we try to sort of bring them up to speed as to what we're looking for and some of the things they may see on the property. So they, so with best man management uh, practices that they might encounter, this is something that may be new to them. A lot of our volunteers come from the nursing background, teaching background, banking, uh, we have engineers, and um, maybe they like the bird, maybe they're hikers. They're all lovers of the outdoors, but they don't have knowledge of farming practices. They don't have knowledge of uh, um, some of the restoration efforts that go on and what goes into putting in a restoration effort. So this is what we try to do during our trainings, um, primarily. So when a volunteer comes to us and wants to become a volunteer steward, we do have a training and we have a training manual. And in the training manual, it talks about what we expect from the volunteers and what, how to prepare yourself to go out, some of the safety measures. We never go out alone. We always go in pairs, sometimes in threes, just for safety. Um, and we supply a camera. We uh, also supply a safety vest um, and we try to sort of educate them on what they can do to, to protect themselves when they when they go out in the field. Um, there are in our manual and then online there are 
hundreds of, of documents that they can then tap into to kind of further educate themselves if they're interested. We have one that's interested in mushrooms and we have another one that wants to learn how to do, identify trees and are the, um, the, the noxious plants that we encounter or invasives or so there's all kinds of resources that we supply to them and then we also give them information how to tap into the Maryland Extension Service and all the information they have. As we celebrate 30 years, we look back on the tremendous support from over 130 families across the Lower Shore who have chosen to work with us and to conserve close to 25,000 acres. We're grateful to our county and municipal partners for their initiatives to improve water quality and habitat and projects from the private sector and the public sector provide measurable benefits. As we look ahead, we are looking at new ways to work with landowners and our local communities so that we can restore areas critical to connectivity for wildlife, to bring resources for implementing best management practices, and to protect the lands which will offer the most benefits for people, wildlife, water quality, and resiliency. At the Lower Shore Land Trust, we wish to ensure that sufficient lands remain to support forestry and agriculture as vi viable industries on the Lower Eastern Shore. Thank you for supporting our work.